Good afternoon, everyone. I see the mic is working. There's some people coming in from coffee break, but I'd like still to kick off and take advantage of our time uh, with our speakers. So uh, welcome to the session on contemporary economic and financial crises and the limits of international uh, regulation. Uh, for those of you I don't know, and that's a good number of you, my name is Margot Solomon. I'm at the London School of Economics in the Law Department and the Center for the Study uh, of Human Rights. And I'm delighted to be chairing this panel, not least given the excellent uh, commentators that we have uh, lined up here this afternoon, but also given the pressing nature of the topic that we'll be um, covering. And the key word in the title of this panel is, in my view, the word limits, limits of international regulations. But that in itself is question begging, limits depending on what objectives and what values. Today we'll hear about the limits from a, from a variety of perspectives, including macroeconomic stability, as well as international cooperation, and perhaps even in the discussion, social justice, human rights, inclusive growth, a sustainable uh, development. What are the limits of economic and financial regulation according to these uh, various uh, values? This speaking order will be uh, my far left, uh, Michael uh, Weibel. I'll introduce all our speakers in a moment, who will offer a broad historical and global angle before zooming in on Europe, covering macroeconomic uh, imbalances and the international a financial architecture. We'll hear from Luke Friedem, who will ho home in on, on Europe in particular, and lessons uh, from the Eurozone uh, crisis. And then we'll turn to Inga Kahl, who will uh, broaden the conversation, looking at, at uh, inclusive governance, sustainable development, policy coherence, through the lens of international cooperation, and in particular, uh, uh, bringing a global public good perspective to our, our, our questions here. Each speaker will have about uh, 15, maximum 20 minutes, and will certainly allow a good half an hour for uh, questions from, uh, from the audience and discussion with the panelists. So allow me, if I may, to introduce uh, our speakers, starting with uh, uh, Michael Vibel. Michael is a university senior lecturer in international law at the University of Cambridge, and he's deputy uh, director of the Lauterpacht Center uh, for International Law and fellow and director of the studies at Jesus College. His research focuses on international economic law and the settlement of international uh, disputes. He teaches uh, international law and EU law. Uh, in 2008, the American Society of International Law awarded Michael the Deke Prize for his age-old article opening Pandora's Box, Sovereign Bonds and International Arbitration, and ESIL awarded him their 2012 Book Prize for his monograph entitled Sovereign Defaults Before International Courts and Tribunals with CUP, a 2011 publication. He'll talk uh, to the topic of how effective are current mechanisms to address macroeconomic imbalances. I have to my uh, immediate uh, left, Luke Frieden. Luke currently serves as chairman of the board of directors of the Banque Internationale à Luxembourg since, uh, since 2016. Uh, this year, he'll be a visiting professor um, in law at the University of St. Gallen in uh, Switzerland. Uh, significantly, from 1998 to 2013, Luke was a cabinet minister in, Luxembourg, in the Luxembourg government, minister of justice, as well as minister of treasury and finance. After leaving government, Luke was from 2014 to 2016 vice chairman at the Deutsche Bank Group in London and chairman of the supervisory board of the Deutsche Bank Luxembourg. Prior to his career in politics, he worked as an attorney. He has degrees in law from the Sorbonne, from the University of Cambridge, and from Harvard Law School. He'll speak to the topic of the role of law in financial crisis, lessons from the recent financial and Eurozone crisis. And last, but certainly not least, in the center, we have Inga Kohl. She's both an independent consultant on global policy studies and also adjunct prof uh, professor at the Herdy School of Governance in Berlin and former director of the offices of the Human Development Report and Development Studies at the UNDP uh, in New York. She's published widely and for many, many years uh, 
uh, work on a range of issues around global governance and international cooperation. At two uh, volumes include the edited volume with OUP, Providing Global Public Goods, Managing Globalization, and uh, coming out uh, this year with Elgar, Global Public Goods. So without further ado, I think I'll give the floor to Michael. If you'd like to uh, use the podium, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be on this panel. I look forward to, to learning and, and discussing uh, with my uh, colleagues. Um, so I've chosen a fairly narrow uh, topic. Um, I want to focus on um, the, the world's efforts to deal with macroeconomic imbalances and how successful or unsuccessful these efforts have been uh, over um, the last 70 years or so. Um, I will start uh, by looking at the global level, that is the Bretton Woods system created in 1945 and its attempts to deal with global imbalances um, before taking a look at contemporary uh, global imbalances. And then finally taking a look at Eurozone internal imbalances and the European Union's recent attempts to deal uh, with, with these imbalances, particularly the macroeconomic imbalance procedure uh, created by the European Union during the crisis. I'm going to suggest that the macroeconomic imbalance procedure um, is perhaps a step in the right direction, but a, a rather small step, and it certainly is no quantum leap in dealing with macroeconomic imbalances. Uh, in um, the Eurozone. Um, <clears throat> now, what are, first of all, macroeconomic imbalances and why should we worry about them? So, macroeconomic imbalances um, refer to longer term imbalances in the current account. That is, um, the difference between the total value uh, of goods. Um, imported and exported, and services imported and exported uh, by uh, countries. Um, <clears throat> so these um, macroeconomic imbalances, if they persist over time, um, can have um, large-scale macroeconomic uh, effects. For example, they can lead to the buildup uh, of public uh, debt um, that can, in the long term, uh, endanger um, financial uh, stability. And what we observe um, is that these macroeconomic imbalances um, tend to be um, persistent uh, over time. They take often a very long time to unwind, and markets do not self-correct um, these uh, imbalances. Um, I'm not sure this, um, the slides do not seem to work, so I'll, I'll do that um, without slides for the, the time being. Um, so, first of all, let me take a brief historical detour into uh, macroeconomic imbalances in 1945, so World War uh, II is just over. Uh, what is the position um, then? Well, at that time, the United States has emerged as the world's largest creditor, and the United Kingdom is the world's uh, largest debtor. And it's against that background uh, that the Bretton Woods, that delegates converge at Bretton Woods and negotiate the IMF Articles of Agreement. And one of the biggest questions facing the delegates at Bretton Woods is how do we share the burden of adjustment between debtors, particularly the United Kingdom, um, and creditor states? Um, John Maynard Keynes, writing just before the Bretton Woods Conference, said the following. Where we have trade, where one country imports persistently um, much more than it exports, the pressure of adjustment should not fall, as it has in the past, almost wholly on the weaker country that is, the debtor country. And so he proposed a, an international credit union. 
So he proposed an international credit union. But the United States was very concerned uh, with this proposal and ultimately blocked it. It didn't want to create, in this new international organization, International Monetary Fund, a giant credit scheme that would ultimately serve to bail out uh, the United Kingdom. And in particular, the United States was unwilling to tolerate interference in its surplus position by this new international organization. So the, um, the United States was not willing for the IMF to play any meaningful role um, in contributing to unwinding um, the current account surplus of the United States. So that's the position um, after 1945. What about um, contemporary sorry, um, global imbalances? Now these global Im um, imbalances as a feature of the world economy have not um, gone away. It has been one of the most contentious um, points uh, between the United States and China in particular uh, in uh, the last decade, contributing to large buildups in, in Chinese reserves um, until uh, very recently. And um, there have been attempts, particularly by the United States, to get the International Monetary Fund involved in monitoring and ultimately shaming member states into doing something meaningful about these persistent um, current account surpluses or um, deficits. Um, <clears throat> there was, largely at the behest of the US Treasury, um, an attempt to create um, a bilateral surveillance mechanism over, members, over policies of IMF uh, member states that looked particularly to whether there was a fundamental misalignment uh, of a member's exchange rate. Now, the, um, China reacted very um, negatively to this attempt to enlist the IMF um, in policing uh, global imbalances, largely because the IMF's proposal copied the language almost one for one um, from a US uh, bill. And there was also opposition to this attempt um, from within uh, the IMF. Dominic Strauss-Kahn, at the time managing director of the IMF, called it blackmail by the United States in exchange for US funding uh, for the IMF. And the episode, this failed episode of creating a framework in the contemporary international economic system for monitoring and doing something meaningful about imbalances, damaged the IMF's um, credibility and no meaningful um, surveillance um, of this aspect of member states' macroeconomic policies um, materialized. Now, what about um, the European Union? Well, the European Union has also uh, faced significant macroeconomic imbalances, uh, particularly uh, within uh, the Eurozone. Now, of course, by definition, exchange rates are fixed uh, within uh, the Eurozone. But because of inflation differentials, um, the real exchange rate within the Eurozone varies. And labor costs, and of course that has received a lot of attention um, since the outbreak of the Eurozone crisis, um, have diverged significantly uh, in various member states of um, the Eurozone. And the same applies to export performance. So what we have seen is the emergence of a um, core and periphery um, dynamic, pitting creditors against debtor uh, countries. That is, countries that persistently run current account surpluses, such as Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and those countries that persistently run current account deficits, Greece, Spain, Portugal. And then there are also imbalances in neighboring countries that are not inside the European Union as such. Switzerland, Denmark uh, come uh, to mind. And, and this graph um, shows you the evolution of um, current account deficits and surpluses uh, for the Eurozone from 2000. It shows you in, in three, at three points in time in 2008, 2013, and 2015. 
And you can see, for example, that um, the Netherlands and Germany, and as well as Luxembourg, are persistently in surplus uh, during uh, that period. And the same applies uh, to debtor countries. So again, we have similar um, dynamics, this time inside a currency union, and member states struggle to come up with an effective policy response to unwind these imbalances that have um, negative uh, macroeconomic effects. So in uh, 2011, as part uh, of a, a wider um, um, <clears throat> reform package, member states introduced the macroeconomic imbalances procedure. And that procedure has the express aim of looking at these imbalances. External imbalances, that's the ones I have focused on, the current account, but also the net international investment position, competitiveness and export share, and also internal um, imbalances. Now, the preventive arm consists mainly in monitoring um, these uh, imbalances, and member states are categorized um, for this purpose. And then there's also a corrective arm that, in principle, can um, um, sanction member states uh, for failing over longer periods of time uh, to unwind on these imbalances. Though it remains to be seen, and I'm not very optimistic, whether that um, corrective arm will be a, a very effective mechanism. So here uh, is the categorization under this macroeconomic imbalances procedure uh, for 2014 and 2015. Um, and you see that in the best category, so to speak, no imbalances, there are no countries in, in the Eurozone. Um, and in the category Im imbalances which require monitoring and decisive policy action, we find, for example, um, a surplus country that is um, Germany. Um, and other countries as well, such as France, that suffer from excessive uh, imbalances which require specific and, uh, and decisive uh, policy actions. So we have this new mechanism, but so far indications are that this new mechanism is not a terribly effective way of dealing with imbalances um, inside um, the European Union and the Eurozone in particular. Two commentators had the following to say uh, about the macroeconomic imbalances procedure in 2013. They say essentially the macroeconomic imbalances procedure is much ado about nothing. The com commission will, can and will start an in-depth analysis that might lead to political reaction and lead to enormous debate in the media. But nothing of substance is likely uh, to come of it. So that brings me to my conclusion, looking at macroeconomic imbalances um, more generally. What are the lessons from, in my view, um, from the last 30 uh, years? We can't, first of all, rely on markets, at least not on markets alone, um, um, to unwind these imbalances. They can persist over very long periods um, of time. And especially for surplus countries, there are often disincentives um, to unwind uh, these imbalances and strong political resistance. And if we've seen that back in 1945 in the form of the United States, and we see it now in the form of Germany, for example, uh, in uh, the Eurozone. Now, debtor countries often advocate that there be some effective multilateral solution. Keynes had done that in 1944. Countries on the so-called periphery have done that over the last five years uh, in the Eurozone. But creditor countries, from their position of strength, often refuse uh, to play along. Now, even in a currency union, in a political and economic union as integrated as um, the, the European Union and the Eurozone, it hasn't been possible to date to come up with a truly effective 
mechanism to deal with imbalances. The macroeconomic imbalances procedure is, in my view, a step in the right direction, but it is weak and incomplete. And one particularly important question, in my view, is um, what role does a supranational central bank that, after all, has financial stability in the Eurozone as part of its mandate. Um, what role does that institution have in um, alleviating the consequences of these imbalances or even unwinding these imbalances uh, over time? Is perhaps an amendment uh, of the current um, mandate of the ECB uh, the way forward? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and indeed I would uh, immediately like to react to a number of things that Mike had said, but um, uh, in particular when he talked about the um, macroeconomic imbalances procedures of 2011, where I was uh, a member of the Council of Ministers when he adopted this. And this actually is a good transition to what I was going to say about the Euro crisis and the lessons for European and international law. Because the law is always the expression of political choices. And it's the expression of political choices in an environment that automatically leads to compromises. And compromises among 19 in the Eurozone or 28 members in the European Union, of course, leads, leads to texts which can never be satisfactory for professors of European or international law. And now looking at this from a certain distance after having left government two years ago, I do see that a number of these texts are not perfect. But the question is, can we improve them, and what is the role of the law in any case in times of crisis? Margot said at the beginning that the most important word in the title of this um, seminar this afternoon is the limitations of the law in times of crisis. I would say that my experience is that in times of crisis, the law, to a large extent, is inexistent, at least in the economic area of uh, Europe, and the law develops as a consequence of the crisis. And we have many examples in Europe where that is the case. And I would even say that it's not only the case in the economic area. When I look back what we did, and I was Minister of Justice in 2001, after the dramatic events of 9-11, quite a number of European legislation, texts, that were for a long time on the table and didn't manage to find the necessary majority, at that time, unanimity, because let us not forget that at that time, unanimity was required in just and home affairs. We managed to adopt them as a consequence of the terrible terrorist attacks. The same is true today in the area of justice and home affairs, and it's true in the area of um, a European uh, financial law. A number of these texts were adopted as a reaction to what happened or under public pressure. Um, the reaction is certainly when we needed to deal with a number of financial aspects that in the past people thought should not be regulated or not be regulated to the same extent. I'll give you a few examples. Derivatives. We only managed to find a text after the crisis. Hedge funds and private equity funds. We managed to adopt the directive on alternative investment um, uh, fund managers after the crisis. We developed a new directive on investor protection, the so-called MIFID II directive, which now uh, recommends the banks quite a number of uh, obligations or ob uh, obliges banks to observe a number of obligations vis-a-vis -vis their clients, advising them prior to them making investments. All that was a reaction to the crisis because the, we, we got the impression, under public pressure or not, that depends on the item, that it was more necessary afterwards to regulate a number of things. So my point is, to a large extent, in existence of the law before the crisis and regulation and sometimes over-regulation after the crisis. CRD4 is another example of the new capital requirements for financial institutions. Of course, banks were always regulated, 
but we noticed that a number of banks had problems. They were not strong enough, so new criteria were introduced, making it um, more complex for banks to operate or having bigger capital requirements uh, to support events of a crisis should they occur again. So a reaction and a new law to prevent these things to happen in the future. The same is true, of course, for the macroeconomic um, environment. Um, and um, indeed, the Eurozone, if I concentrate on that, uh, to a large extent, needed to be uh, strengthened. And there I would come back to a point which uh, this morning was made at, um, by the, for those who attended the presentation by the Latvian Minister of Foreign Affairs. He spoke about Schengen and the incompleteness of Schengen or uh, the imperfection of Schengen. I would not call it that way because at a certain moment in time, things are not considered to be imperfect. When Schengen was created and when Schengen was developed, a number, if not all member states, refused that the external borders should be controlled by European border force. And everybody said, borders is for us as sovereign nations to protect. And I remember very well in 2005 when I was chairing the Council of Ministers of Justice, we, we set up Frontex, the external border uh, police, but almost every member state said they can only act as a support force to our border officers and never replace them. Now, after what has happened last year, the huge influx of uh, refugees, uh, this issue is again on the table. The same is true for the Eurozone. If you look back at the first reports regarding a European Monetary Union in the 70s, uh, the Pierre Werner report, in the late 80s, the Jacques Delors report, they all mentioned that you need, in fact, for a currency union, which is a, a currency that does not relate to one state, you need at least three elements. That is a fiscal union, that is an economic union, and that is a political union. It's not something that we discover today, but we felt in the crisis, especially those who were sitting at the table of the Eurogroup, that we did not have all the tools to intervene with European instruments and institutions because member states were reluctant to give this power to a European institution. And that is still the case today. Although there are initiatives, there are proposals to strengthen uh, the Eurozone, but I'm not sure whether they will find the necessary uh, unanimous, unanimous consent of the uh, 19 member states, because that is required at least, if not of the 28, if some treaty changes are necessary. We have made progress after the crisis. We have reinforced, reinforced the rules regarding fiscal discipline. In, a, in my view, too complex manner with quite a number of European texts, two-pack, six-pack, stability and growth pack, uh, fiscal compact, uh, which nevertheless lead to a way that the member states will be more rigorous in setting up their national budgets, in particular because there is a peer review system where every minister of finance has to come to the council, has to go to the commission and present his budget. The economic union is far from being realized. And therefore, the macroeconomic uh, imbalances procedure of 2011 is indeed a minimum text. But it's the only text that we managed to achieve. Because despite a number of political declarations, I think there is no agreement to give a large chunk of economic policy to a, to a supranational, i.e. European level. And I think that, therefore, the whole economic union dimension has improved, but will not substantially be transferred to European level in the years uh, to come. I think it has improved in the sense that, indeed, member states have to present in the framework of the European semester, i.e. when they prepare the state budget, they have not only to present their budgets of the next year and years, but also to present some common rules on their major reforms that they want to undertake in the area of economic law, the so-called structural reforms that they intend to do, pension reforms, um, and other items that might have an impact on other countries' 
of the Eurozone. So that is a consequence of the, of the crisis that has been undertaken, but there's still a long way to go. I also think, Michael, that there will be no change in the, uh, in the objectives set for the European Central Bank. We know that we have an objective that is different from the Federal Reserve or from other central banks. But um, I think um, if you look back at the texts and the discussions at the time when the Master Treaty was adopted, uh, the, the stability aspect, the price stability aspect, based on the German influence in particular, was considered to be the only major objective for the European Central Bank. And I have the impression that today uh, the, um, this objective would not be, could not be changed with uh, even a majority of member states uh, present around the table, although it might be advisable uh, to do so. But in any case, I think that if we do not give more power to the European Commission and to the Council of Ministers in certain areas to decide even on issues, economic issues, that today are within the ambit of the national states, new crises may easily occur again. And then I would like to say a word, and we may come back to some of these uh, issues um, and thereafter. I would like to say a word about the imperfection of European and international law in times of crisis or thereafter. It remains largely imperfect because it is a compromise that has to be done in a very quick period of time. When the crisis occurred, subprime crisis, um, banking crisis, sovereign crisis, uh, euro crisis, we met week, and week again and again, and uh, we had to come up quite quickly with uh, certain texts. We had no uh, book to look into what could be done, although some of the uh, research that had been made, some of the uh, scholars had, um, and some of the think tanks had written interesting pieces on elements that afterwards uh, were taken into account, for instance, on the banking uh, union. But we have to take into account that it's a compromise. We have to take into account speed. We have to take into account uh, the languages. And I would not underestimate that um, some things mean different things in different languages, um, not only in, in if you translate, but also in the concepts that are used in some um, uh, legal traditions. And therefore, the comparative law aspect is also one which one should not underestimate. The result is even more uh, unsatisfactory because the institutions that develop these laws are quite different. A number of these initiatives came from the G20. The G20 is, an, is as you well know, an, it's not even an organization, it's a gathering of the largest economies of the world. They give um, impulses, but they do not, they do not issue legally binding uh, recommendations. So this has to be implemented, and um, um, the same is true for other recommendations, such as Basel. Basel III was implemented in CRD IV, Capital Requirements Directive in Europe. So all this leads, of course, to a little chaos, uh, which is, from a purely legal perspective, not extremely satisfactory. Um, you also have, therefore, texts that are that enter into force, even if not all member states have adopted them. Take the fiscal compact on on more discipline in budgetary affairs that uh, has been uh, signed by 26 out of 28 member states. And we had a provision in the treaty saying that it would enter into effect if 12 member states would ratify it. It has been done outside the European treaty with rules that we have never accepted before in the construction of the European Union. All this again leads to a legal imperfection. Therefore, I would say that um, we need to make sure in the future, in the further develop, future development of financial and economic law, that there is a level playing field in a global economy. We have to make sure that the rules in the major economies are applied in the same way. That is in Europe the case, but also in our relations to the United States, uh, to um, Asian economies. We have to talk about implementation and um, I think there the European Court of Justice in the framework of uh, the European Union has a very important role uh, to play. I'm, for instance, extremely grateful to the government of Ireland that they challenged the recent decision by the EU Commission on Apple in the uh, European Court of Justice because there is no international 
law on this aspect. There, is, there are some basic rules on state aid, and it will be extremely interesting to see how the state aid aspect will be decided upon by the European Court in the context of um, uh, the international European taxation and state aid. And we have to make sure that there is a certain coherence between what we do, to what extent are new laws that we adopt in financial area, in the financial area, have a positive or negative impact on growth, on the way we structure our European companies and European banks in comparison to the rest of the world. Do we require more or less? Do we allow competitors from outside to be therefore more competitive than our companies? Uh, competition law issues, of course, are here that um, are coming to my mind, but also within the European Union. Bank structure reform, capital requirements, is that, uh, does that work together? Do we manage to keep strong financial institutions that we need for the future? But in any case, I think that in a crisis, we deal first with political challenges and we look at the law in a second stage. Very often the law doesn't exist and we have to develop it thereafter to prevent the next uh, crisis. The law is never perfect. The law is, as I said at the beginning, the result of a political process, of political compromises, and therefore I think it's useful that lawyers, non-political lawyers, look at these, make us aware, or make those who are in charge of legislation aware of deficiencies, and hopefully uh, those who are politically in charge can base themselves on that, and at the same time I think you, we as scholars have the role to inform people why in certain circumstances there's a need for transfer of sovereignty or a sharing of sovereign powers to make international and European law more efficient and thereby to prevent crises to happen that affect us all. Thank you. How do I get started here with? Ah, there it is. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> you can stay here. Good afternoon again uh, to all of you, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, my starting point for the presentation this afternoon is a uh, simple observation, and this is that um, uh, international financial regulation possesses strong properties of a public good, not only this, but of a global public good. However, when you look at the uh, literature on uh, uh, financial regulation, it's extremely rare, uh, it doesn't happen at all, that scholars actually employ the analytical lens of public goods or global public goods in order to uh, examine uh, the um, uh, uh, issue of international financial regulation. So I thought, why not uh, do it and uh, see what we see when we look at international financial regulation through this uh, lens. Um, I will proceed um, in the way indicated there. I will briefly, very briefly, uh, so that we are on the uh, same level um, and understanding, uh, uh, introduce the concept of public goods and global public goods. Then I will briefly argue why uh, international financial regulation and in which way possesses uh, these properties. And then I will apply uh, the uh, lens. And you see indicated here that I will address uh, four examples. Uh, in order to illustrate that there may be some added value of using uh, uh, this uh, lens, because uh, what you can see is, uh, uh, first of all, um, that um, uh, we, uh, that, uh, uh, we find a, a strong mismatch between the various dimensions of publicness uh, in the case of international financial regulation. Secondly, we find extreme uh, cases of multi-actor failure, market failure, and state failure, uh, leading to inefficient, ineffective, and um, other weaknesses in regulation. Then a particular uh, um, uh, type of failure that concerns 
us here, I think in large measure ourselves, uh, is academic failure. The two abstract wrong theories, repeated, 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 and uh, even justifying market and state failure. And finally, I looked and looked and looked through the literature, and what one doesn't find is a clear definition of what sort of good uh, uh, are we wanting to achieve? What is financial regulation to be about? What purposes is it to serve? Whom is it uh, to serve? So with these remarks, uh, let's get started, and I try again. Um, no, that goes the wrong way. Here's the definition very briefly of uh, public goods. And uh, public goods are goods that possess uh, uh, one or two properties. Uh, they are non-rival and or non-excludable. And uh, they are actually in the public domain, goods in the public domain, that, like the light up there, uh, when they are non-excludable and we can all be affected uh, by them, either enjoy them or uh, be uh, hurt by them. And that is a very important point that we have to bear in mind. There is nothing good about public goods. The word stands for things and conditions in the public domain. It's a value-neutral uh, term. However, in today's multi-actor world, uh, many of these goods are also public in provision. We have public-private partnering and so on. And um, uh, uh, so, but the defining property of a public good is its being in the public domain, uh, non-excludable. Important is also to realize that uh, the uh, publicness and privateness of a good are no innate properties. One can change them uh, relatively easily, so we have to think of public and private not as a dichotomy, but rather as a continuum, and that the next slide uh, uh, shows you can see that, and one could also vary these goods, they can move along the continuum and we can be made in most cases more excludable uh, or less excludable and they are only mainly the natural global commons like the moon or the sunshine, also where we would have a hard time trying, uh, finding ways of uh, making them excludable. So there's nothing good about these goods, and it is a choice, as it already was mentioned uh, before here, where to place the good. And this choice uh, character in a world of wide disparities and difference uh, like ours, of course, makes public goods very often highly contested things, and in particular global public goods are contested things because the differences and disparities worldwide are, tend to be wider than within particular uh, countries. Then uh, what are the global public uh, uh, goods? They are often uh, scholars say, oh yeah, they are just public goods that reach a little further in their publicness uh, in consumption. But we have to see that uh, publicness in consumption is not just overlaying like a skin uh, uh, the countries of the world or also the uh, oceans or the, uh, other things, but they penetrate into countries because most uh, global public goods have emerged uh, as a result of globalization, a globalization of formerly national public goods. And often this hasn't happened uh, really with consent and voluntarily, but has dr sort of uh, spilled into countries from the IMF or the World Bank, uh, think of structural adjustment programs and so. So uh, global public goods are, uh, if they are not meeting the national priorities, they are of course very, very contentious in many cases. And, of course, there are much more public in provision even than most national public goods because we have so many countries and so many people on earth. And uh, in order to really understand the, uh, the uh, complexity of uh, these goods, publicness in provision, I uh, added this uh, slide on the provision pass of uh, a summation global public good, and most global public goods are of a summation type. There are so many people and uh, actors and institutions who try to propagate one or the other good or fight against it and uh, the states try to do something, international organizations try to do something. Then there are the externalities, the accidental spillovers. The provision of a global public good is like a spaghetti bowl 
and therefore uh, we have to guard ourselves against uh, the, the uh, conceptual dichotomy uh, that is very popular these days, that some scholars say, no, no, we need uh, international, more international uh, cooperation and top-down approaches. Then the others come and say, no, no, we need bottom-up approaches. No, we need it all. And basically the provision pass uh, is a, a policy loop always churning, churning, going around from the bottom to the top coming back and from private uh, to public. So this picture is very important uh, to bear in mind when we now move on to um, uh, uh, international financial regulation. Let me first say why I think that international financial regulation has strong global public goods properties because um, uh, like most norms or uh, law, whatever you call it, uh, 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 these norms and uh, uh, agreements that are being formulated are often f formulated with the explicit intention and by design to reach out in the world and make many people preferably uh, comply with them and implement them. And in the case of international financial regulation, of course, we want also national regulators to pick up whatever is internationally being decided. But in the case of international financial regulation, there is a large other group of uh, people who uh, experience uh, financial regulation as uh, being public in consumption, namely those who either make a fast good buck uh, from the existing regulations or those who get severely hit when there is a crisis or things go up and down and economic growth stalls and jobs are being cancelled. So uh, virtually it's so public, uh, worldwide public in consumption, international financial re regulation, that's uh, quite a, a strongly uh, public, uh, global public uh, good. And um, international financial regulation, as I indicated already, is of course also public in provision uh, because um, it has to be nationally implemented, the private sector has to do something, the states have to do something. So uh, clearly I would say international financial regulation is a complex um, uh, public good. But when we now look closer at how the process of um, international financial regulation actually currently works. Then the next slide um, that I show, I jump to, uh, where is it, here. Uh, the rhombus of publicness. Because we live in a world of uh, um, multi, increasing multipolarity. Not only this, but the policy makers, uh, when they go home back to their country after international meetings, most of them today have to be more accountable to their constituencies. So uh, they cannot go home and say, my God, I, I have been pulled across the table. We have been cheated. No, when, uh, uh, people want to know that if one cooperates on something like international financial regulation, there is a certain amount of utility coming out of it. It's not only costing something, but preferably it has a net benefit. So if you have a a good like international financial regulation that is very strongly public in consumption, is also public in provision, then uh, how in, do you get to publicness in utility, a rather uh, sort of uh, even uh, spread of uh, net benefits that are considered to be a fair distribution? I think one way is uh, to say there must be a publicness in decision making. Those affected by the good as a result of its publicness in consumption should have a voice in how to shape these rules because then you have a certain competition among ideas, among interests, and one can strike compromises if everybody has an effective voice. And why is this important today? Uh, because we are moving out of this uh, period that we had until now where uh, the hegemon came and said this is the good we provide, this is how we provide it and now we all get going and had enough coercive power to push certain uh, things through. This is no longer that easily uh, possible. 
And therefore, I think what is expected today, explicitly or in the back of uh, negotiators' minds, is to say, if we are being affected by the good, especially for, for worse or rather than for better, and if we also have to uh, contribute to uh, its uh, provision, then we want to have a say so that there is a better chance uh, that uh, some net benefits occur for us from all these uh, undertakings. So that is my conjecture. I would say that's the condition uh, uh, of uh, efficient and effective provision of a global public good, including international financial uh, regulation. And, um, but what do we see in reality? In reality, we see these uh, four things. I, it's so difficult to see from here. I won't show any more uh, slides. I just now will go through so that we can stay in time. First of all, uh, what we see is um, uh, that uh, the mismatch between uh, the four dimensions of publicness. Uh, when you see who and where, where and uh, the uh, international financial regulations are being made, you see the Financial Stability Board, you see the Basel Committee, uh, there you have um, uh, 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 regulator associations, the national, some national regulators themselves uh, uh, present. It's a rather um, a small circle for the Financial Stability Board, mainly the G20 uh, member countries. So compared to the publicness in consumption and provision of international financial regulation, the, uh, the uh, decision-making, what rules to follow, how to define these rules, and how to implement them and uh, monitor and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the decision-making is a much more limited process than uh, the uh, publicness in consumption and uh, provision. And as a result, I would argue, and uh, I leave all of this for your further study and research, uh, we have a highly uneven uh, distribution of uh, net benefits. The, uh, the uh, regulation so far before the crisis in 2007-8 and nowadays, including Basel III, are such that the international financial regulation works for a few very well and has certainly contributed to the increase in inequity in the world and it works for many, many not that well. So there is a conflict and a severe mismatch between the dimensions of publicness. And why is this uh, happening? The reason is the multi-actor failure. According to standard economic, public economic theory, uh, you open any textbook and it says, oh my God, these markets, you know, they fail in the presence of uh, public goods. And therefore, because these bad market actors, therefore we have to get the state in and the state, even Joe Stieglitz complaining so much about globalization, but his textbook says exactly that. We get the state out of the basket and the state will correct it. Not in the case of financial uh, regulation. There you have the state, the national regulations. First of all, the whole issue is being approached rather uh, at the technocratic level. Nowadays, uh, the G20 leaders chime in, but mainly it's a little uh, technocratic club that sets uh, uh, the rules. So um, uh, the states, uh, the regulators regulate themselves, basically, including the supervision regulation that they formulate. So it's a very a sort of in-group type uh, uh, regulation. In addition, the state who is supposed to regulate the markets is so indebted to the markets and uh, hold the, the private um, uh, uh, banks and other hold so much uh, uh, debt of the states uh, from whom they have borrowed, uh, the state has borrowed from them. So uh, there is a sort of dependency relationship and therefore I think that explains also in part uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, rather uneven distribution of publicness that we have noticed. Let me quickly go to the next part, the academic failure. Uh, I find it quite amazing uh, to hear this, uh, this statement uh, that, oh, yeah, we cannot assume uh, the markets to be self-regulating. Yeah, why on earth have we first assumed it? Yeah, I mean, who, it is quite an am amazing idea that the markets should be self-regulating. When you think of externalities, when you think of uh, power uh, conditions and relationships and so, it was a weird idea to begin with. And now, for the whole economic community, or not only the economic community, and if I mention it here, uh, to the extent that economics is coming into international law, the international law community is also chiming in, in uh, this uh, 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 statement. No, uh, sure, markets uh, uh, fail, uh, and especially in the case of international financial regulation, because they are not free riding on, on this uh, uh, global public good international financial regulation because they want to avoid its uh, uh, provision and therefore they are very proactive in uh, contributing to the regulatory process. They are not free riding as the uh, standard economic theory would predict. And the states are not regulating, uh, as I mentioned, uh, because of their uh, dependence uh, on the markets. But all of this is not yet being queried systematically uh, in the economic theory. Moreover, who is the state when the state moves to the international level? The state at the international level is a quasi, uh, is a particular actor, I always uh, say sort of quasi-private actor too, an individual actor, and the state to the extent that there is free riding uh, also involved, of course, also do it, let others do it, and I lean back and uh, wait whether somebody else uh, uh, takes an uh, initiative. So the state is an individual um, actor internationally, and when you look at the relationships between states in international negotiations, I would argue that we must get used to saying this is also a, a market, it's a political market, the international negotiations context, and this political market is very, very poorly regulated. Because um, or during all my years in the UN, I could watch the monopolists and the oligopolis, the, the US and the EU, uh, exercising market power, you know, uh, we wouldn't tolerate it that easily in economic markets, but in political markets we do it. Information asymmetries uh, abound when you look at uh, uh, delegations, five people coming from Lesotho, but a thousand maybe from Europe. Uh, so everything that makes economic markets fail makes at present the political market fail. And that is uh, also a very important reason for the um, uh, weaknesses in international financial regulation. The last point, what we don't see when we look through the glasses of uh, the concept of global public goods is a clear definition of what, the financial, what, financial, what we want from financial markets, what the financial system is about, and certainly not a clear statement of what the international financial regulations want to achieve, what purpose do they pursue. One finds a mention to stability, but it cannot be that we don't want nothing more than stability from financial markets. Sure, we want st stability, but do you want stability in the uneven distribution of uh, income and wealth that these markets constantly recreate and recreate and recreate and add to, I mean, that, that cannot be, you know? So, but you don't find a very uh, sort of um, a clear statement of what the purpose of international uh, financial regulation is. You, the developing countries begin to chime in on this point in the G20 discussions that they say, no, we must also look for a more inclusive finance and so on. 
and um, uh, uh, add some other uh, concerns uh, to the debate. So how to get out of all of this? This is my um, coming to my last point, uh, and that is a research agenda for any one of you who has an interest uh, in it. I think it's really time to rethink. And not, uh, uh, I, I think it's great what I observe in international law to broaden, uh, to become a little more interdisciplinary, but beware of conventional theories in economics. We have to rethink. We have to rethink public economics and we have to rethink uh, um, other economics uh, subfields. Uh, um, and importantly, we have to begin and recognize that um, international financial re uh, regulation is not alone in having problems. It is having the same problems that most global public goods have. And that tells us that we have to rethink international cooperation. Am I correct in arguing that it is a political market, a weakly embedded a political market? Is what would the embeddedness and the inst institutional uh, sort of uh, alignment of uh, the political market international negotiations involve? What could it uh, be about? One uh, idea linked to this is that maybe we have to turn to the UN uh, one more time uh, uh, and say we, we have to uh, add to the notion of sovereignty the idea of a responsible exercise of sovereignty to begin with. Don't just spill your garbage across your borders, the toxic financial products and whatnot, or lux regulation. No. Try to rein in uh, the the cross-border uh, spillovers. However, uh, having watched government behavior for a long time, I would say, even if we had such a norm, we wouldn't still be okay. Therefore, here comes another shocker for you: my proposal that we what we need in the multilateral system and in the maybe under the aegis of the UN is an independent global stewardship council. Uh, where the ocean has a representative, the atmosphere has a representative, financial stability has a representative, communicable disease control, where not states are only there, they can also have three seats, but where an independent body monitoring the imbalance is looking out, pointing to win-win situation that one could uh, pursue. And uh, that would be, without that, uh, a basic change in governance, nationally and internationally, I think uh, you would have a hard time changing any particular issue area in a meaningful way. Coming to more um, regulation-specific recommendations, first and foremost is that we get back to the politics of it and try to figure out what is it that we want from financial markets. I remember this saying that was more frequent earlier, that is the markets, uh, financial markets are to serve the real economy. You know, the real economy is about quite a lot. You know? So how do we formulate it into uh, uh, goals uh, to which international financial regulation uh, could make a contribution? And I cannot see how without knowing where you want to go, one can find the right rules. Nowadays we have a situation where we have uh, without disclosing it and saying it loudly, we have a goal, and that is not to dampen the risk appetite of the uh, private financial actors. Let them go on uh, trying to uh, make uh, uh, good returns on their investment until we hit another wall. But that's nowadays a sort of implicit goal, but we should have explicitly uh, stated ones. And once we have the goals clear, then we can uh, begin to set the rules and to see who should have a voice to come up with a process of consultation of all concerned, all those who are experiencing publicness in consumption as a result of the international financial regulation. And the rest I can do when we uh, enter the discussion. So I leave it um, for this and I look forward to your publications on some of these issues.
Okay, we have some good time nonetheless. Thank you so much, uh, Inga and other panelists. Uh, we started about uh, five or ten minutes late. So I'd like to open the floor. I think we've, uh, there are many, many ways to review what these panelists have, have offered. I think one or two thoughts come to mind. One is how uh, we've been presented perhaps with two ways of it, thinking about international law, so the limitations of its form and the limits of its substance. We heard about the limits of its form through the politics of international law, how international law is reactive rather than, than proactive, um, the various means of, of regulation, uh, different institutions, different international organizations, uh, extra legal uh, systems, the lack of participation. So questions over form and the making of international law and the weaknesses of international law and questions over substance um, that, that the norms we had have clearly failed to prevent multiple crises, that there's no indication that international law is, is fit for purpose moving forward in terms of its normative structures. Fragmentation, we've heard effectively, without using that word, a lot around a policy incoherence and normative incoherence. So questions over the, the form and, and substance. And I think another big issue that's come up is around uh, what constitutes the public interest for many, many years, uh, forever in a way, and this came to the fore, I think in all presentations, tacitly or explicitly, but Inga really dealt with it, uh, the idea that the public interest was somehow served by a, by a stable economy, stabilizing the economy or paying back creditors was in the public interest and coterminous with the idea of the public interest. And of, for, and of course, it's far more complex than that. So we might want to think about what constitutes the public interest, how we understand it, how we define it, and how international law in its multiple guises contributes to it. But with those brief comments, I'd like to open the floor. For questions, please introduce yourself and affiliation. We have uh, Uli, and then we have Anne, and then we'll move over here. Uh, my name is Ulrich Petersmann from the European University Institute. Let me first congratulate you for a very inspiring discussion. But I think uh, Inge Kaul has drawn the attention to the fact that there are multiple market failures, multiple governance failures, and they do apply not only in your special area of international financial regulation, but they are, we see the same market failures and governance failures and the incapacity of the UN, the incapacity of the World Trade Organization to protect public goods also in international trade regulation, international investment regulation, international environmental regulation, and uh, Inga uh, uh, Kaul rightly also emphasized these uh, public goods are interdependent. Fifty years ago, uh, Jan Tinbergen received a Nobel Prize for economics for his theory of separation of policy instruments, and this is reflected in the separation of uh, UN specialized agencies for these functionally separated public goods. But, uh, I mean, uh, my question would be, is uh, this economic theory of uh, separation of policy instruments really consistent with our constitutional experience that market failures, governance failures exist across the board. All these specialized uh, international public goods are interdependent, over overlapping. And if we uh, want to deal with market failures and with governance failures from the point of view of citizens, from the point of view of human rights, from the point of view of principles of justice as defined by democracies, then we need a constitutional approach. That is uh, the history of 2,500 years of republicanism, democratic constitutionalism, cosmopolitan constitutionalism. That is, market failures and governance failures must be constitutionally limited in a comprehensive manner. We cannot fix it only in special areas like fin financial regulation. So p could you please broaden your discussion a little bit and go beyond uh, uh, financial regulation or see the problem of financial regulation as part of a much bigger multi-level governance problem that the UN and the WTO are, systemic, uh, are systemically failing to protect international public goods. And what we see in the area of financial regulation is just one typical problem which has much broader constitutional dimensions. Yes, let's take three questions. Um, okay, thank you. Anne van Aken, University of St. Gallen. Um, I would have one question to Luke and one to Inge. Um, uh, 
Now, Inge, you, you talk about the publicness in financial markets, and it's, I found this very interesting, so thank you very much for that. Um, I just wonder whether, especially in financial market regulation, um, if you look at the European example, there's a special procedure for financial market regulation, the lamp policy process, and why was this done? Because the traditional procedure of legislation was just too slow. And then, you know, financial markets are, they're moving incredibly quick, and it's in deeply expert knowledge. I think there is a deep, so I'm happy there are people like Luke who understand both, because most policymakers don't understand what's going on in the banks, and even the bankers don't understand what's going on in the bank. So I find it very hard to say we should have more publicness on that. Um, then you, you need to be able to explain plain it, but then it's so very detailed that it might not be a good idea to have more publicness on it. And now my, my iPad is failing, so. Um, the other um, thing on the UN, if I look at the UN Security Council and that we know, um, you know what a seat in the UN Security Council is worth for a developing country. I mean, this, this has been done, right? I mean, this is purely political market failure, it's corrupt. We can count on how, many develop how much development aid a country gets once it's on the Security Council from the different members, the P5. So, so I wonder whether we, you know, when, even if there is a political market failure on the national level, but at one point and what kind of, and that somehow follows up on you, what kind of governance mechanisms we have on the international plane to, to, to deal with market failure on the international plane and within international organizations. To look, you know, when you were talking, I thought about, would I bake a cake if I don't have the butter and the eggs? I would probably not bake it. And then it seems to me that with Schengen and with the Eurozone, we tried to bake a cake it needed to fail. So isn't it better just not baking it? You know what I mean? It's, I, I wonder if we, are, if we don't find a consensus, if we know that if, and I mean, that is when, when you listen to people, when they say, how could you do Schengen? And then we have this crisis and we don't have a much stronger Frontex. So everybody blames it on Brussels. And I totally understand that you can only go that far, but then, isn't it better just to say, well, then we don't have Schengen? And I'm, I know I'm provocative here, but I just feel that we are provoking crises, maybe, real-world crises, by having inadequate law, too inadequate law, for the subject being we are trying to regulate. Thank you. <clears throat> we had the third here. Thank you. Uh, Luis Hinojosa from Granada University. Um, thank you to three speakers for their thought-provoking interventions. Let me focus uh, on Michael, because he has finished his intervention with a question, uh, and I would very much like him to answer it. Uh, you were saying, just at the very end, that uh, uh, what is the role of the European Central Bank uh, in correcting imbalances? And then you ask it to yourself, maybe that uh, we need to reform the statute so that it can fight uh, macroeconomic imbalances effectively. And uh, I wonder whether that's necessary because uh, the European Central Bank has been quite efficient in fighting macroeconomic imbalances, uh, playing the role of a European, of a central bank. Uh, uh, after the Pringle judgment of the European Court of Justice and above all after the Gauweiler uh, judgment, we know that uh, the European Central Bank may sell or buy uh, outright marketable instruments, uh, whether they are public or private, so it can buy not only public debt but private debt, and that it can differentiate between member states because the, the court said expressly that the selective nature of the program was not a problem, uh, that uh, uh, the European Central Bank can um, uh, distinguish between members, member states to rectify imbalances between member states. Uh, it said, uh, literally, uh, to rectify the disruption in the transmission of the monetary policy. So 
uh, if uh, the European Central Bank can buy public debt and private debt, if it can differentiate between member states, uh, what reform do you need of the statute of the European Central Bank to allow it uh, to fight uh, macroeconomic imbalances? Uh, of course, of course, there are more things to do, but it's the governments, the national parliaments, that have to do these things. But if you keep the European Central Bank just as a central bank, what else do you want him, the central bank to do, uh, the European Central Bank to do, to correct macroeconomic imbalances? So I think it's pretty well. Thank you. I'll turn to the panelists. Maybe we'll start with Michael and move down the row. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Luis, for, for um, this question. Well, um, <clears throat> I, I think you're absolutely right that um, the European Central Bank can't really do all that much with regard to Eurozone internal um, imbalances. It can do something about external imbalances, Eurozone versus the rest of the world. It, it can fight the symptoms of these uh, imbalances, but um, it is really up to um, fiscal authorities, and the European B uh, Central Bank itself has said that uh, multiple times. And I do think that the European Central Bank um, has um, tried, I think, under tremendous stress uh, to find some balance uh, in this uh, rapidly increasing center-periphery divide that we have seen um, in the Eurozone. And I think that was the only choice really open to the European Central Bank, acting as a central bank for all uh, members um, of um, the Eurozone. So I think, I mean, and maybe that's also a comment um, about um, one of the things that Luke said. Um, in terms of firefighting, I think the Eurozone has actually done uh, quite well. I think, I mean, if we take the political objectives as fixed, I think the drafters of the ESM treaty can be proud of what they have achieved in very difficult circumstances. I think it effectively achieves uh, its goals. I think the law firm that came up with the Greek debt restructuring can be proud of a successful debt restructuring. Now, we might not agree with a lot of the political parameters, that's true, but within those political parameters, the firefighting exercise um, has been quite successful. They've dosed the fire, it will probably reappear. Uh, but So I think I focused on um, some of the underlying um, macroeconomic um, imbalances. I think on the preventive side, there is more uh, work uh, to be done, and I think there um, our instruments are um, falling quite far short. I think they will always be imperfect. We can't aim for perfection, but I think we are far away from where we need to be. Should I continue? Thanks. Yeah, I will start with Anne's question and then uh, uh, link it to the question raised uh, by Ulrich Petersmann. Uh, the financial markets are fast, complex, and whatnot. In large measure, I think this is a myth. Uh, they are indeed fast, but uh, do they have to be as fast as they are? And while uh, governments talk about uh, this uh, high speed, uh, to limit the high speed trading, you can read simultaneously in the paper that a new sea cable was uh, uh, laid across the Atlantic and uh, banks are shifting their location to be at the exit point of the sea cable so that they gain a few nanoseconds and have a uh, trading advance. You can regulate this away. You know, it must not be as fast. If you don't want to regulate it away, then one would have the choice to say we have banks and banks that should um, uh, uh, not uh, invest and get into too high risk uh, uh, trading. And we have banks that don't get in advance the promise that never mind what happens, we stand ready uh, to bail you out. The bigger you are, the more bailout uh, uh, you will get. So there are options and policy choices we have. And it is mainly the, the um, uh, finance industry that comes up with this myth of complexity. Now, if you package and repackage and repackage and repackage back loans, yeah, it becomes a very complex thing and uh, you can't really look into it and you don't understand it anymore. But this is, um, my, uh, in my view, pollution in the same way 
that we pollute the atmosphere. Toxic products should not be spilled across borders. Keep them home if you want them. But <laughs> and that is even not possible because the spillover effects will come uh, in any case. So we have to ask ourselves, how complex must it be? How fast must it be? What would serve the real economy? And uh, you mentioned in the morning the uh, new agenda 2030. Uh, for what sort of finance do, do we need for, uh, for that? And uh, how can we use uh, international financial regulation to have stability for all these purposes that we want to achieve uh, through financial markets? How do we affect change? Uh, um, I think uh, the publicness in decision-making uh, covers also consultation to a large extent before coming up with the one rule or several rules. One can have wide-ranging consultations and find out what people expect from finance, what their experiences are, what one could uh, change, what one could do in order to rein in uh, the rising inequities through um, uh, financial regulation. So, uh, in large measure, publicness in decision-making can be improved through more consultation, and then you can move up uh, for the decision-making process, so that you also have a, uh, effectiveness and efficiency in decision-making. However, nowadays, uh, we should not link the UN too closely to international financial regulation, because the Financial Stability Board has nothing to do with the UN. Yeah? And, yeah. That, uh, and that, uh, that is, a, is a club arrangement um, uh, that uh, sprang up uh, in the G7, G8 process, now the G20 process. So it's, it's, it's also not accidental that it is in a club and not uh, in a more uh, multilateral and more participatory uh, decision-making uh, venue. And yes, um, uh, uh, I think... Uh, one has to give him credit for that, that Martin Wolf has raised the question of rethinking the Tienbergen rule because of the relationships between finance and so many other issues and how they then uh, again uh, relate to each other. He said we have to really seriously rethink this rule. It doesn't work anymore in a world of uh, interdependence. I thought this um, was uh, quite a uh, uh, bold step uh, on his part to come forward uh, with this. And um, again, you know, we, we should uh, have discussions nationally about financial markets and what we went from them and how they affect our pensions and, and, and whatnot. And then uh, find, uh, think through hard about what would be the appropriate venue uh, and uh, what sort of membership these venues should uh, have. And uh, of course now we have only a little time, but I think if you once feel that the way things work at present are not the best, then it's always interesting to say how could we make it possible uh, that we affect change. So, yeah, if now there is such uh, high-speed trading that the government regulators can't follow it, then maybe one can have also a slower finance process uh, and leave the high-speed trading to those who want to do it. They can do it, but they should not expect uh, a public bailout then if something uh, goes wrong. Uh, so, um, uh, but we are living in a time where we really have to re-engineer to innovate and I like financial innovation. I think for risk management, it's great. And uh, let's have more of it. OK, thank you. I will limit myself to two uh, observations for time reasons. One is um, I have to react to what uh, Inge said earlier on when she said um, that, uh, or she questioned the purpose of uh, financial regulation. I can tell you as a lawmaker, for us during this entire crisis, the purpose was very clear. That was to re-achieve stability, but mainly to protect the investor and to protect the ordinary investor and depositor. So the ordinary citizen was protected by giving state money to a number of banks. It was to make sure that the system would still continue to function and mainly that the depositors would be uh, protected. So that was the main... I 
you, you paid for it as a taxpayer, you paid for it, but if, if the state would not have done it. So I say the purpose of financial regulation was to make sure that the depositor would be protected and to make sure that in the future these things could not happen anymore. And the depositor itself, himself at different times asked for different things. I'll give you one small example. Those uh, clients who went to a number of Icelandic banks that, have, that were in a number of European countries, why did they go there? And I met some of them. They went there because the interest rates that they offered were much higher than in other banks. The question at that time, if any regulator or any law would have prohibited those banks to offer those rates, people would have said, well, it's not for the, for the government to, or for the central bank or for the regulator to fix the maximum interest rate. So um, regulation is perceived as a, with a different purpose at different times, but for the lawmakers in the crisis, at least in Europe, and I would say at the same time for the US and Asia, at least with those I spoke, was clear to make sure to protect the investor, to protect the depositor, to protect the state. That is then the whole resolution mechanism, because when we started saving some banks in Europe, there was no resolution mechanism. So their bailout was the only possibility, unless we would have sacrificed the interest of the depositors. Second remark, but uh, in the context of the first one. We now should not only focus on the problems that we had in the crisis, but for the international financial law, I think it's essential that we now look at the non-banking sector, fintech, all those new developments. Because one day we might discover major problems there, and then people would say, we will organize a big conference at ESAL, and we would say, well, what is the answer of law to fintech, to Bitcoin, to all these things? So I think that is a, that is a task for the lawmakers and for the academic community to before something happens. Finally, to this difficult question of um, Anne uh, van Aken, I think that um, if you want immediately something perfect, you won't do anything in a complex world. Because I'm not sure that when uh, Schumann and Adenauer started uh, the European community of coal and steel, they were exactly sure what this would, um, this would be about, how it would exactly function. But they had one purpose, and that was to have institutions that would make sure that peace would be preserved on the European continent. When Afterwards, Schengen was created. I think the purpose was clear. Free movement for all these uh, citizens and at the same time, more cooperation of police and justice authorities. So if you have an ideal, a purpose, I think you should try to realize it, knowing, however, that in a political world, the perfect solution cannot be there. So I would still bake the cake. It would not taste perfectly well the first time, but if I would invite you the second time, and if you, you would tell me all the ingredients that are still missing, then I think um, it's worthwhile doing it. Not everything can be missing, so you have to, be, to agree on the main ingredients. And that is my last remark, therefore. I think the constitutional construction of um, Europe has to be rethought. And um, I think Brexit is, in fact, an excellent occasion, although a painful one, to rethink this whole structure. I gave a few examples where I said we do each time something else, Schengen, Fiscal Compact, Euro, different number of member states, this becomes unreadable. So I think we probably need again an, a core uh, where all the policies, including maybe a political union, are realized, this kind of Kern Europa, but probably a few circles around for taking into account the needs of countries like the United Kingdom, like Switzerland, what do we do in our relationship with um, uh, Turkey? So it's probably in an, an, an various Olympic circles that have intersections, and that maybe is a task for lawyers as well to define this in these times of um, crisis. But crisis there will always be, so the law is there to structure the future to come out of these uh, crisis, but we bake the cake together next time. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. I'm sure there's many other questions. I had my question on Luxembourg and tax uh, havens that we didn't get to, but uh, we'll raise it certainly at the coffee break. Uh, it remains for me to thank you all for your questions and indeed for the panelists for their fantastic presentations. Thank you. Thank you.